All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Northern Now, which is a digital event series presented by NMU Alumni Relations for alumni and friends. My name is Kylie Bunting. I'm the digital engagement architect here at Northern Michigan University for alumni relations. I'm glad that you've joined us for tonight's presentation, which has been a topic that has been highly requested by all of our alumni. So we're really excited to be able to bring this to you today. So we're excited to continue this series, but first I just wanna talk about a couple of logistics. So uh, while we're unable to see and hear you during this webinar format, we certainly want to still hear from you. So um, please send any questions that you have through the Q&A function. And moderator Susie Ziegler and I will be monitoring this Q&A section. So any comments, questions, anything that you have for our presenters, please feel free to um, send them there. We're going to have our presenters um, give their presentations first and save all questions and answers until the end, but feel free to send your questions in um, at any point during the presentation and we will address them as soon as we're done. You can also use the chat function to talk with others who are watching, which is located at the bottom of your screen and chat with some fellow alumni and friends who are also tuning in. Just a quick note that in that chat window, there's a drop down menu to send chats to all panelists or all panelists and attendees. The default is all panelists, which means whatever you send will only come to us. Um, so change that to all panelists and attendees so you can send it to everybody who's tuning in. Just a couple of, uh, actually one upcoming event that I wanna touch on, our last Northern Now of the semester, a little summer send off cooking segment. This also is backed by popular demand. We have Chef Alden Griffiths joining us, who's also an NMU alumni. She's NMU's executive chef. She's gonna be sharing some of her favorite summer recipes on June 9th. So make sure that you join us for that. I'll send uh, the link to the registration in the chat in just a few minutes, but you can learn more at our website, nmu.edu slash alumni slash events. And of course, keep in touch with us. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Um, email us at any time. We'll, we love to hear from our alumni. So now I'd like to welcome our moderator for this evening, Dr. Susie Ziegler, who is an NMU professor, the department head of uh, Earth, Environmental and Geographical Sciences Department, and also the associate dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Thanks for joining us, Susie, welcome. Thank you, Kylie, you are very welcome. And I'm just absolutely delighted to be here and to introduce our two speakers of the evening, Mr. Barry James and Dr. Troy Henderson. So I'd like to give just a little bit of introduction and then I'm gonna just take it, let them, let them take it away and educate us on the history of the UP. So Mr. James graduated from NMU in 1993 with a bachelor's degree in history. He also holds a master's degree in industrial archaeology from Michigan Technological University. He's currently a historian at the Michigan Iron Industry Museum in Nagani, and he manages historical exhibits and interpretations at Fort Wilkins State Park in Copper Harbor. He also assists with collections, exhibits, and interpretive programming for state administered sites in the Upper Peninsula. Dr. Henderson graduated from NMU in 1999 with a bachelor's degree in history also. He went on to earn his PhD in the joint public history, American history program at Loyola University of Chicago. In addition to his title as historian for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, he is a historian with the Michigan History Center at the Michigan Iron Industry Museum, as well as at the site he is a site historian at Fayette Historic Town Site. And you're going to get to hear about all of these really neat historical sites throughout the course of the evening. I've enjoyed interacting with both of our speakers when bringing NMU students on field trips to the Mining Museum. It's been wonderful in all seasons. We went snowshoeing uh, before the pandemic hit actually last winter. We didn't get to go on a field trip there this year, but it's been wonderful to be able to expose our students to this really rich history and the wonderful exhibits and then these two wonderful people who always are so enthusiastic and passionate about what they know and about passing on that knowledge. So without further ado, I am going to pass it over to Mr. Barry James, who will be our first presenter of the evening. Thank you.
Thank you, Susie. Um, just to uh, clarify a little bit, what Troy and I are going to present is going to be talking mostly about um, um, uh, iron mining and the history of uh, iron mining and that how it relates to our historic sites in the Upper Peninsula. So on the map you see in front of you, we'll be talking about one, two, and three, um, Port Wilkins, uh, Michigan Iron Industry Museum, and Fayette Historic Town Site. And weaving you through um, early history of the state all the way up until probably the 1890s and then talking about modern mining yeah, in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, first, I'd like to start talking a little bit about Fort Wilkins as a military post um, and Michigan statehood and the first people. I always like to talk about when Michigan became a state. A lot of times, especially students that come and visit us um, really don't know when Michigan became a state. Um, Ohio had an issue and when the, uh, the, we had a territory in which both Michigan and Ohio belonged to as well as other states, but Ohio wanted Toledo Michigan wanted Toledo Strip and uh, the Toledo War um, sort of got statehood moving and Ohio ended up with the Strip of Toledo and Michigan ended up with the Upper Peninsula. And uh, the people in Michigan weren't really happy about it. Um, they considered the Upper Peninsula a barren wilderness. And what was up here at the time, um, they considered trees, water, woods, um, uh, there was some Native Americans in the area, the local tribe of Ojibwa, about a thousand people who lived near water sources. And the state realized that they really needed to work with the local tribe to obtain the land before settlement could even happen. And they also needed to know what was up here at the same time. So in 1842, the um, Treaty of La Pointe was signed with the Ojibwa. And that opened up the Upper Peninsula, uh, the western half of the UP. So, when Michigan became a state, they hired Dr. Douglas Houghton as the first uh, state geologist, and he was taxed with coming to survey the Upper Peninsula, not only for geology but also for a linear survey to survey the property up here, so um, people com could come and move in. And he wrote a 1841 report to the Michigan legislature about the natural resources in the Upper Peninsula, which really stirred interest in the region. It really started America's first great mining boom. Um, news of the discovery spread across the United States, but the significance that I usually try to bring as a, a, a point of his discovery and report is that it started six years before the California gold rush. Uh, most of the time in the history, uh, we don't hear a lot about Michigan copper and or iron. And uh, six years prior to the gold rush, explorers and settlers were coming here. And it began at Copper Harbor in 1843. Um, Houghton had noticed uh, copper deposits there in his report and people began to come up. Um, this is a bird's eye view of Copper Harbor and a modern view, but I've put in sites uh, with Lake Superior, Copper Harbor here, bordered by Porter's Island. And at Porter's Island, they had the Mineral Land Agency. So any explorer or miner that came up here who wanted to uh, go exploring for deposits had to get a permit at the island. And there were thousands of prospectors coming into the area. And uh, one report noted that there were white tents that littered Copper Harbor area with people trying to get their permits and head for the hills. And the first mine sites, first commercial mine sites were the Pittsburgh and Boston uh, copper mining sites out near Hayes Point. John Hayes was a druggist out of Pittsburgh. He led the mine and operated the mine and was the director of the mine, got money to fund it. And these sites were located at Hayes Point or Lighthouse Point and adjacent to Fort Wilkins. The problem was uh, the mineral land agency on Porter's Island, General Cunningham, didn't have any support. So they were worried that there was going to be an uprising between the Native Americans and the miners because there was a small band of natives at Grand uh, Portal who still had claim to copper deposits out on uh, Isle Royal. And they were concerned that there was going to be a problem. So um, these were some quotes that were listed at the time when the copper rush were happening. It really was national and it really was a big deal. So the fort 
Uh, it was built in 1844 to keep peace in the copper country. Um, ne not really necessary. They spent more time keeping an eye on the miners than they did on the Native Americans. Uh, really no problems with the local native population. And um, much of the post was prefabricated. Um, for example, they had 36 stoves, 57 doors, 138 windows, 2,700 shingles, uh, 40,000 feet of flooring, 120,000 feet of uh, lumber, 48,000 bricks, 16 head of beef cattle, and four pairs of oxen. Now all that had to be shipped up from Detroit. So it was a big process to get them up here to construct the fort. They blasted the land fl uh, flat. It was rugged to build uh, housing for two companies of soldiers, Company A and B, 5th Infantry, um, commanded by Captain Clary. And it was only garrisoned for two years during its first occupation from 1844 to 1846. Um, half the garrison left to fight in the uh, Mexican War in 1846, and then the post was shut down. It, during the interim between the second occupation and the first occupation, um, the fort was used as a health resort by Dr. John Livermore and the pure water of, of the uh, Keweenaw Peninsula and Lake Superior, the fresh air really attracted people up there. And then it was turned over, um, his health resort venture um, ended when he passed away and the United States Lighthouse Establishment gained control of the federal property. And then it was re-garrisoned again uh, from 1867 to 1870 by veterans of the Civil War. Um, Uh, the enlisted men who served at the fort came from varying backgrounds. Their average age was 29, and they had enlisted for five-year terms during the first occupation, uh, making $7 a month. And during the second occupation, it was for three years, and they were paid $16 a month. Most had been wounded, wounded during the Civil War and still had time left to serve on their enlistment, and that's the reason why we think that the fort was reoccupied uh, after the Civil War ended. Fort buildings, uh, a large complex typical for a military post set in a square setting bordered by Lake Fanny Ho to the south, Fanny Ho Creek to the west, um, Lake Superior to the north, and um, a boundary with a stockaded wood stockade elsewhere. Um, different buildings for different ranks, uh, married enlisted men's cabins. This is uh, an image of four of the cabins that were reconstructed at the fort. Uh, each cabin is a duplex, so you have two apartments on each side, but as many as five people would be living in one small room. And the location of the cabins outside of the stockade gate, we think, according to military records, were to provide privacy. But the difference here is if it depended on the wind direction with some of the smells here, because to the east, you had the stables in the slaughterhouse. And to the west, you had the bakery. So it could make a little bit of a difference um, regarding uh, sensory uh, perceptions in that area. Uh, the parade ground with officers quarters, um, the fort was a, a fairly busy post, but there were um, never really issues with the Native Americans here. And it was mostly routine duty, but it was active. Um, you know, they had to maintain the buildings. They had to go on guard duty. They had a four acre post garden at the base of Rockaway Mountain that needed tending. They had uh, water police. So it was constant maintenance um, from the time that the, the soldiers that were stationed there. Workshops to support the fort complex, a blacksmith shop to, to take care of the animals and then repair tools, carpenter shop for the construction and repair of the buildings, and a bakery. Uh, fresh bread was a, um, a, a modern staple for the, obviously the soldiers preferred fresh bread over hardtack or hard bread. So soft bread was a great addition for them. Uh, the diet at Fort Wilkins, there was a lot of animals on post and um, they ate extremely well. Uh, pork, salt, beef, soups, roast beef, potatoes, fresh and hard bread. And during the second occupation, they could get mostly anything shipped up from regimental headquarters at Detroit, at Fort Wayne. Um, took about three days for supplies to get there, but it often times would arrive spoiled um, because of the distance. But if the soldiers were to come back to Fort Wilkins today and make a comment about their diet, 
they really had nothing to complain about, especially during the second occupation, because they also had something called the tin can. So you could get pineapples, um, anything that they really wanted, uh, fresh coffee um, delivered to the fort. So oftentimes when you think of frontier posts, you think that they're, they're subsisting on hunting. Um, officers did a little bit of that, but no, there wasn't a lot of wild game there anyway. I mentioned uh, animals, so we had fresh beef on the hoof for uh, the soldiers at the fort and they ate well within the mess halls. Transportation, they had two draft horses to help haul and move goods that uh, would land by water um, at a dock in Copper Harbor a mile away. No battles ever occurred at the fort. Uh, like I mentioned, the soldiers were very busy with fatigue duty, taking care of buildings, taking care of animals, post garden. Um, but they also oftentimes would drill as well in, in full kit. And we know that from the uh, regulations and reports that we have from the National Archives that they, they would do that um, in the parade ground and they were busy. Uh, transportation was difficult. Obviously, this is an image of a quarterway road, which would be put over uh, swamps and some small streams. Um, so uh, overland travel was difficult in the first occupation in the 1840s, mostly snowshoes and then uh, trekking uh, Native American trails to get around. But the second occupation, they had access to uh, better roads and oftentimes they would travel in the winter too. So. Here's an image of the bridge that leads into the fort taken after the fort was um, abandoned and showing the guardhouse, which would be a checkpoint. So if you were to visit the point, fort, you'd have to go there and uh, check in to state your business and go on. But the most difficult problem was uh, transportation through uh, Lake Superior and supply. Um, once winter set in, the ice would freeze and Fort Wilkins was um, basically shut out from the rest of the world for about six months. Overland mail would come by uh, dog sled from Green Bay, it took about three days for communications with the outside world. Um, later on, they did have a telegraph in Eagle River at the county seat, 22 miles away. But imagine 25 feet of snow and trying to keep paths and everything clear and open so you could uh, actually function within the fort. And when they got so much snow like this, inspections were taken on Sundays and they would dress in full kit and stay on their porches, but they had to clear paths, make sure they could get to the sinks, make sure they could get their supplies. But traveling over the roadways in the winter time was actually easier than the summer because they would pank or pack down pathways with uh, rollers and make it hard pack. So um, they had a better walking and, and traveling means. The post was shut down um, by the military in August of 1870, basically because of um, soldiers ending their enlistments. They're, they weren't getting support troops coming in and they um, it was just too expensive to maintain. So it was abandoned in uh, August 30th, 1870. I've been in the fort um, for winters and, and took most of these photographs during the winter time on Father's Day about four years ago. And, and the stockade around the fort is nine feet tall. So during this drift, I was able to walk over it. So it gives you an appreciation of what these soldiers had to deal with during the winter time. And um, which also led to morale problems and discipline problems. Soldiers would go into the village and, and bring alcohol back to the post. The guardhouse would sometimes be overflowing um, because the men were getting into um, liquor too much and the commanding officer would put them in the guardhouse because it was against army regulations. After the soldiers left, uh, the fort became a, a very popular tourist destination and it also started to become in disrepair. Uh, in the late 1890s, uh, right around um, 1900 or so, buildings started to come down. Um, people that were visiting the place were taking parts of buildings, using them to build fires. We've been fortunate over the years that no major Fires have happened within the fort complex, but we do have a couple of buildings that are no longer standing, even though we've re reconstructed a few. Um, 
again, it was became a popular tourist destination. And finally, Houghton and Keweenaw counties came together to purchase it with the idea of making it into a, a state park. Fort Wilkins today, um, like I said, became a state park in 1923. Today, 19 buildings survived. 12 of them are original structures from 1844. So visitors to the park can go into those buildings. The uh, four married and listed men's cabins have been reconstructed too by the WPA. Um, and we've been working as for to restore those buildings. We're having some issues with restoration um, and maintaining some of these structures over the years. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. Um, it really primarily serves as an excellent example of a mid 19th century military post. And in addition to um, it's interpreted through exhibits, audio visual programs and our living history program and outdoor interpretive signs. We interpret three themes at the fort, um, copper mining, military life on the frontier and also uh, Fort Wilkins State Park has two lighthouses, the Copper Harbor Range Light, which is across from the fort, dates to 1868, and also the uh, Copper Harbor Lighthouse out on the point, which is also part of the park. So we've got 22 uh, historic structures with exhibits and, and collections in them. Uh, bird's eye view from across Lake Fanny Ho. Uh, Lake Fanny Ho was named Lake Fanny Ho because Fanny was a sister of an officer's wife who was expecting and she came up from Virginia to visit and it was very typical when building frontier posts that the officers would name landmarks after officers wives and their families so not only Lake Fanny Ho but um, as well um, as other lakes in the area and we're continuing to do restoration projects at these places we did and archaeological projects. Uh, most recently we did an underwater archaeology project on Lake Fanny Ho to find uh, relics and things that were in the lake and um, by state underwater archaeologist Wayne Lusardi. And we found mostly trash, but we really needed to know it was there because we have an issue with people taking things in parks and we don't want that to happen. And we've also done several years of uh, restoration to uh, the Copper Harbor Lighthouse and the dwelling next to it. So we're continuing to uh, work with those efforts. We're continuing to improve the site. And uh, we hope that at some point, you folks can come and visit if you already haven't been there already. Another site that we have in the Upper Peninsula that's administered by the Michigan History Center is the Carpenter or Jackson Forge. And it's located at the site of the Michigan Iron Industry Museum in Nagani. Um, Nagani's about, we're about nine miles west of Marquette where the museum is located. Uh, we're situated in the ravines of the Carp River and behind the museum, is the historic site, the Carp River or Jackson Forge. Uh, the Jackson Forge, uh, the museum is a modern facility built in 1987 and with an addition put on in 2005 and in, it interprets uh, the Michigan iron ranges and the people who work them. And we also um, have some outdoor properties that people can enjoy and visit. We're part of the Iron Ore Heritage Trail. We are a trail head. So the museum is located here. Our main entrance is off of US 41 to come into our parking lot. And then for visitors to enjoy the outdoors, we have a geological trail, which uh, NMU alum and uh, friend John Anderton helped us work with. And also um, uh, the R River Overlook Trail, which leads behind the museum and has an overlook of the historic site behind the facility. Uh, we also have the Barnes Hecker Memorial located in our overflow parking lot um, as well. Uh, the Carp River Jackson Forge was a primitive operation. Um, Philo Everett from Jackson, Michigan came up here and was going to go searching for copper and eventually um, ran into a person by the name of John Nolan at Sault Ste. Marie and Nolan told him that you don't need to go to the copper country. He said there's ore back of Carp River. So he showed him a sample of it 
and Everett came up here and, and had a chance to create some interest and create a business and look at opening up uh, um, the Nagani Jackson mine. And then they eventually decided that they might want to process that ore locally. So the, the, the Carp River Forge was the first iron manufacturing in the Lake Superior region. Uh, the ore came from the Jackson mine. It was mined directly from the surface in open pit. And the goal was to uh, make bar iron or, or um, for up here to bring it to the lower lakes to be processed because that's where the market was located. And at the time, they really used the most advanced technology. Uh, it really was a primitive operation in a sense. It was like a large bl uh, blacksmith's forge. It had a large trip hammer that would pound and, and, and work the iron to get the impurities out of it. And the product from the Carperver Forge was tested um, against other iron throughout the world. And it was determined uh, based on the percentage impurity that the iron that came from the Jackson mine that was processed into uh, bar iron at the Carp River was the strongest and the best of all um, of anything in the world at the time. So it, it also received a lot of recognition nationally, which caused people to come up here again, not only to look for copper, but eventually uh, iron ore in uh, Marquette Iron Range. It failed as a business operation because of uh, partly the location of the, um, they chose the Carp River because of water power to power the forge. Um, but the first year, um, the dam, they had, it was an 18 foot tall dam that kept the water power back, uh, broke during a, a spring flood and had some poor management and poor transportation being um, nine to 10 miles away from Marquette over uh, ravines and, and other things, it was tough to get back and forth. And the environment contributed to, like I mentioned with the dam and flooding. This image shows a little an image of the Jackson mine, which opened in 1846 and actually worked in Nagani until 1923. But he, there's an image up here with three men double jacking, working the ore, it would fall down and then they would haul it away either by blasting uh, the ore down or working this method to make a shot hole to move it. Um, looking at some maps, we, uh, it, during our research, I've been a little bit stymied a little bit by this, because if you look closely, it shows the Jackson Forge with the road going to Worcester, which is Marquette. Now this map dates to about 1848 or so, 49. And it shows the forge on the east side of the river. And recently, um, actually, Troy, was looking at the geological maps at the state archives and we found another one and it shows the forge on uh, this side of the river and then another building here. And with that, um, we had a historic image and showing uh, one of the cabins across the river and the dam to the forge site over here. Uh, the site was abandoned and operated by the Marchetti family as a farm uh, up until the 1960 before the state of Michigan ended up with the property. But uh, this map here from 19 or 1855 shows all the buildings. The museum property is right about here. And it shows all these buildings up the section line. So we did a lot of um, research on the project. We got a lot of information for new exhibits. Uh, it was listed on the National Historical Places in 1973. A monument was put there across the way. And we've done a lot of archeological work on the site. Um, we actually, uh, in, in 2002, Michigan Tech dug around this monument because the monument reads, the, the uh, monument was erected on the site of the Jackson Iron Company's first forge. They didn't find it, uh, but they did over the years uh, find several features and items that relate to the forge site, including the dam, uh, a gudgeon, which is part of the water wheel system, a roasting kiln, all of these features are adjacent to the river or across uh, on the historic site property. And our long-term goal eventually would be to get people over there to see these features. Uh, here's a map showing that the, uh, the road leading to the Jackson, here's the monument I was telling about, the gudgeon, the heavy item was found here and the dam remains here. So this will give you an idea of the layout of the historic site uh, that we would like to interpret more in the future. Uh, the museum again opened in 87. We added on to it and we are looking at 
putting other artifacts. Here's some uh, pieces of the forge that we put on display, uh, which is a merit plate, which attaches to it. Uh, we were able to salvage that and get it over. And we are also looking at putting in new exhibits to talk about the forging process. And uh, we've got trails now that were put in that allow people to go back and look at the site, walk and learn about the site, and also uh, be able to be outside in the environment to where uh, the cradle of Michigan iron industry began here at the Carp River Forge. Lastly, um, some future things that we're going to be doing is the museum has a very rare artifact called the Yankee. It is currently under uh, restoration. Um, we sent it away. We ended up, uh, it dates to the 1890s. It's a very rare vertical boiler locomotive. So um, stay tuned and we'll be looking at getting that restored and put into the building within the next year or so. Thank you, Barry. And uh, I am going to pull up a, another PowerPoint um, that's going to pick up at Fayette Historic Town Site. Barry introduced the Jackson Iron Company already. Uh, but that company actually built Fayette Historic Town Site, which is now in a state park. Uh, on the left, you can see a historic image of the blast furnace complex at Fayette. On the right, that's how it looks today. So the Jackson Iron Company established Fayette's furnace operation in 1867, and this picture was taken then, uh, to basically produce iron ore uh, or smelt iron ore and uh, get it to the Eastern steel industry. Charcoal iron was a highly valued product used to manufacture railroad car wheels, boiler plates, um, and especially Bessemer steel, which was cast into uh, railroad rails. Uh, so the Jackson Iron Company, one of the first uh, companies to purchase large tracts of land and began working Michigan's iron ranges, um, by uh, 20 years after the Carp River Forge that Barry was uh, discussing, uh, by that time the company was big and the, the headquarters had moved to Cleveland. Charcoal iron was of a higher quality than iron produced from coal and commanded its own market. Uh, but e even given that, only about 10% of the Jackson Iron Company's output came to Fayette for smelting. The re remaining 90 uh, percent was shipped out in crude form to the lower Great, Great Lakes, and that was fairly common with other uh, blast furnace operations as well. Fayette Brown was the general agent for the Jackson Iron Company. He chose the site, and the site is named in its honor. Uh, he chose the selection of Fayette, or chose Fayette uh, for a variety of reasons. The first was that uh, a rail line was completed between Nagani and Escanaba in uh, 1864. Uh, and the way they did it was they, once that rail line was completed, uh, the company mined iron in Nagani, shipped it to Escanaba via rail, put it on boats, and brought it about 40 miles over to Fayette, and that's where it was smelted. Fayette has, had a limestone quarry, and if you've ever been there, it has a beautiful limestone bluff uh, uh, jutting up out of its harbor. That limestone uh, was a necessary ingredient in the smelting process as a flux, as well as building materials. Hardwood forests in the surrounding Garden Peninsula could also be harvested to manufacture charcoal uh, that were used to fuel the furnaces. Here's a cross section of one of those charcoal kilns. You can see the hardwood stacked up uh, on the interior, which would char for several days, and uh, that would be used for fuel in the blast furnace. Fayette had a deep water harbor called Snail Shell Harbor, provided safe anchorage for shipping. Uh, the, here's a picture of Fayette's uh, blast furnace, op, uh, blast furnaces in construction. Uh, you can see the blast furnace right here, one stack, another stack is framed and the hoist right here um, would, would be used for supplying uh, charcoal and iron ore and limestone uh, loaded from the top. Uh, the hoist foundation remains, or the hoist does not remain, the hoist foundation does remain, so you can see that today. Uh, in 1870, the company built a second furnace stack um, and doubling its production. By 1875, Fayette was producing some 14,000 tons of pig iron a year. 
And uh, it was uh, the mining journal, Marquette Mining Journal dubbed it as a champion charcoal furnaces of their size across the country. They're very productive. Uh, yet despite its success, Fayette had some serious setbacks. Uh, one of those setbacks was fire. Uh, when you're dealing with charcoal, when you're dealing with molten iron, um, you know, the fire had, had broken out in the blast furnace complex more than once, burning the dock. This is a modern picture of the furnace complex, but the reason I show it is you can see the brick corners uh, columns here. Originally, those were timbers, uh, and, uh, but the, after the fires, they were burned and replaced with brick. This is probably the most iconic picture of Fayette. Uh, this is workers uh, standing on the exterior of the uh, hot air blast kilns, and uh, their uh, boys are out front. Uh, we call them the barefoot boys, and uh, you know each worker seems to have their own implement in their hand, their tools that they use to work with, and uh, the remains of the um, brick um, hot blast ovens are remain today, so you can see where those were, and you can actually go ahead and stand right where those barefoot boys are standing today. This is probably, the previous picture was the most iconic picture. This one's probably my favorite picture of Fayette. Uh, it's a street scene. One of the only ones we have really of the street scene of Fayette uh, where a few people are posing for a picture, uh, but there's enough candid activity in the background that makes it interesting. Little boys leaning up against the barrel. You can see a cart here, which is probably bringing slag, the byproduct of the blast furnace complex, and uh, going to go and get dumped into slag beach. You can see uh, the limestone bluff right here, devoid of most of its trees. A lot of the, so many trees in the Garden Peninsula were used for charcoal production to feed this furnace. This is the machine shop in the center, the stone building. Um, and this building still stands. Um, and we know a fair amount of the people who lived at Fayette. We know a lot of, um, we keep biographical files on uh, everybody that we know that lived there and add to it. And uh, the man on the right is the machinist, Robert Bassler, who actually worked in that uh, machine shop. Fayette had its own sawmill. Uh, so it was kind of a self-sufficient town, self-sufficient community at its peak, about 500 people lived here. And uh, the sawmill is on the lower right here. The superintendent's house, which, st which still stands, uh, was called the Big White House. That's where the superintendent lived, where he had a commanding view of the uh, harbor and blast furnace complex, and he could see the ships coming and going. The vast majority of transportation at Fayette was maritime at that point. Fayette also had its own little railroad network. Uh, here you can see Fayette. They had a, uh, a small rail line that went down into the Garden Peninsula. This is only about nine miles long. Uh, and the purpose of it was exclusively to get charcoal to the, to the Fayette, to the furnaces. Um, and communities sprung up uh, along this rail line uh, that were just uh, producing charcoal uh, to feed the blast furnace. There were nine kilns right on site, but in the hinterland here, there were some 80 kilns. Here we see one of those communities, section nine charcoal kilns around 1887. You can see the beehive kilns in the background, the rail line and uh, the community kind of posing for a neat little picture here. Fant had its own store. Um, it was a company operated store where workers could buy goods on credit. Uh, it, uh, the goods were ordered from Milwaukee, Chicago and Detroit. And uh, the uh, store even had a glass front door here that made it look, quote, somewhat citified to uh, some of the people at Fayette. Fayette had its own meat market. This is the town hall that this building still stands today uh, and had its own meat market here, it had an ice house right here. This is a, a picture of a, our butcher shop exhibit as it looks today, obviously reproduction uh, foods in here. Uh, Fayette had its own hotel called the Shelton House. It was a, a very large, the largest structure in Fayette. This hotel still stands. Uh, here's a picture of the, the back of the hotel where it had a, a two-storied privy. And we get a lot of questions about this. It's kind of a famous feature of Fayette. You can see the catwalk from the wing of the hotel into the two-storied two privy. 
And uh, Michigan Tech had, has done archaeological investigations of this privy and unearthed a treasure trove of things from uh, Fayette intact vessels and uh, just an amazing array of artifacts that, that help us learn about the people who live there. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like, our exhibit inside of the hotel lobby. This is the hotel as it looks today. Uh, Fayette had a row of log cabins where uh, the workers lived. And uh, this is kind of a really interesting picture with uh, some kids. And you can see the board here to collect water in a barrel. Here's another picture of that log cabin neighborhood in the 1890s uh, after the company stopped operating the blast furnace. Here's a reconstructed laborer's cabin. When Fayette became a state park, uh, none of these structures were still standing. Um, so mainly we focus on preservation efforts at Fayette, but in this case, we reconstructed a laborer's cabin so we could have a venue to tell the story of the, the working class and immigration and things like that. Fayette had its own baseball team. Here's uh, Fayette's baseball team. You know, it was a thriving community. It wasn't just devoted to uh, uh, iron smelting, but there was a lot of recreation. Baseball, there was a racetrack. This is an aerial view of Fayette where you can still see the outline of the racetrack and the baseball field was here, the town site is here. Uh, although Fayette had grown into one of the Upper Peninsula's most successful iron smelting towns, by the late 1880s, the market had changed and um, um, charcoal iron production in the United States um, was at about 25% in 1867. By 1890, it had dipped to about 7%. So in 1891, the company stopped operations and uh, with the company gone, businesses closed down. Uh, some people went to uh, um, the surrounding areas to um, take part in agriculture. Some people moved on to other blast furnaces. Um, and here you can see the blast furnace complex in disrepair after the company left. There's another picture of Fayette um, starting to get a little bit overgrown. You can see the charcoal kilns lined up next to the blast furnace. Uh, and in the 1920s and 30s, it kind of be, it was it was an effort to make Fayette as a, a tourist destination uh, with, with some success. Um, by 1857, the Escanaba Paper Company purchased Fayette uh, and traded it to the state of Michigan in exchange for other timbered land. Uh, in 1959, Michigan developed Fayette as a state park. And this is Fayette as it looks today. Um, so we work to uh, further preserve, restore, and interpret the town site for future generations. And now I'm going to return to the Iron Industry Museum um, to talk a little bit about uh, underground mining and a little bit about the modern iron industry, because um, that's part of what we do. You know, we tell the story of the Carp River Forge that Barry mentioned, but we also interpret the, the industry as a whole. And the uh, story really continues to this very day. When most people think of underground mining historically, um, when they think about it, I think um, when they underground iron, when people think of iron mining, I think they think of underground iron mining, but it was not originally like that. Uh, but for a span of about 100 and about 100 years from the 1870s to the 1970s, much of the mining was done in underground mine shafts. These are the three Michigan or the three iron ranges in the Upper Peninsula: the Marquette Range, the Menominee Range, and the Gogebic Range, all in black. When the diamond drill entered the scene in the 1870s, which could bore into uh, underground iron deposits and kind of map out underground ore bodies, uh, underground mining started to uh, spring up accordingly. Here is just a, a small section of the Marquette Iron Range of Ishpeming and Nagani. And you can see the number of mines that sprung up in, in residential areas, in, in, uh, uh, in, in downtown areas, wherever the ore body happened to be, they would build a mine. Underground mine was obviously dangerous. Uh, and they were uh, rock falls, cave-ins. The, the mines had to be uh, constantly dewatered for the miners. So this is a very dangerous activity. Deaths were very common. Um, uh, either individual accidents or more major cave-in disasters like the Barnes-Hecker mine disaster in 1926 that killed 51 miners. 
iron mining, iron mining shaped communities on the three ranges and as well as other areas in the UP that had blast furnaces. So it's difficult to really underestimate the importance of the industry in the UP. Uh, the communities that sprung up around the miners were pre predominantly immigrant in the late 1800s and early 1900s. There were lots of jobs available. Employment in the UP peaked at about 16,000 jobs in the iron industry around 1920. Immigrants came from Germany, Italy, Britain, France, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and so on. And they brought customs, traditions, language patterns, food ways with them that continue to impact the region. One prominent example is the pasty. Uh, most, new, most UPers know what pasties are, but if you went outside of the UP and ordered one, you'd probably get a blank stare. Uh, and that's, this uh, came because of the iron industry. The Cornish miners brought the pasty with them from Cornwall, England. Uh, they had tin mines in Cornwall and the miners were experienced miners and they brought this uh, food way with them. I want to finish by highlighting an important transition in mining that happened after World War II. Uh, up to that point, most mining that was going on was for very high grade ore deposits. Uh, this was so high grade that the ore could be directly melted down in a blast furnace. And it seemed inexhaustible in the 1860s, but after World War II, it was becoming evident that the high grade ore deposits were becoming depleted, especially with the um, World War II increased production. So in the 1850s and beyond, mining companies began pouring resources into research and development of mining and processing low-grade ores, which were still up, which were abundant. Uh, these ores are generically called taconite, typically 20 to 30 percent iron in the ore. And this is an image of the uh, Cleveland Cliffs Research Laboratory in Ishpeming, which is still in use. Uh, the pelletizing process was developed uh, to seize on this low-grade ore opportunity. The research and development led to uh, grinding the ore down into the consistency of really a, a very fine baby powder, uh, and then separate the iron particles out, and then bring that, those iron particles back together as a concentrate in pellet form about the size of a marble. Mining is a, here's a quote uh, that I really like. Mining is a heavy duty, hard business. It requires a lot of land, a lot of water, and it makes a lot of dust and noise. What we do is big in anybody's terms of description. And that's the superintendent of the Empire Mine in 1976. And indeed it was big. Uh, these large open pit mines, uh, here's a, an example of one where a road crisscrosses down. Um, you can see the large open pit you can see the rock tailing piles in the background. The Empire Mine, as an example, is a mile from rim to rim. Heavy equipment, here we can see a truck being loaded at the bottom of a mine shaft and here, or a mine pit. And you can see, see some workers here to give you some scale on how big some of these trucks are. Uh, the industry changed really in the 1850s and 60s and uh, open pit mining became the norm uh, but I like to compare, this is a part of our museum exhibits in 1900 and 2000. Typical workplace was underground iron mines, whereas open pit in, in 2000, they went from a high grade to a low grade ore. The number of active mines was 67 in 1900, two in 2000, only one today. Um, miners employed were about 13,000 in 1900, about 1,700 in 2000, and yet they produce by far more tonnage of ore than those 13,000 did uh, a century before. And uh, this is a big change in the industry, bringing it a new landscape, really. You know, what happens when one of these large mining operations closes? Um, the, the, the large pits will not be filled in with tailing piles. Uh, so the mining companies are required to uh, undergo reclamation activity and here we can see some hydro seeding on a rock pile to regrow vegetation. Here's another example where they used uh, pulp from timber mills on the side of a rock pile to regrow um, vegetation. So finally, I mean, this story has really, the iron industry has really had a huge impact on the region. And the last slide I have here is one of the new exhibits at the museum where I encourage people to share your perspective. Uh, where do you see where do you see iron mining today? It's everywhere if you look at it. 
Um, it's the ORDOC, the names of streets, names of restaurants. And we have a rotating slideshow where people can submit images of where they see mining today. This just happens to be on a, you know, a red kind of dirt road uh, from iron dust uh, at the Nagani mine site. And these rotate. And we encourage people to kind of share their ideas of where you see mining, because if you look, it's, it's everywhere. And finally, we want you to enjoy uh, the history that the Michigan History Center field sites have to offer. This is a map of all the field sites in the state of Michigan. Number one, two, and three are the field sites we talked about today. And uh, I want to mention that Fayette and Fort Wilkins, the state parks, are open to the general public. The Iron Industry Museum, we will be opening on June 2nd, so next Wednesday. And we will be open uh, to the general public on a Wednesday through Sunday basis. And I will go ahead and stop share. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, both Troy and Barry, for those wonderful presentations. Um, just first of all, on a personal note, I would say for those of you in the audience who need to, whoops, start my video. Sorry, I thought I did. Um, I would hope that any of you in the audience who just need to get back to NMU and say hello after maybe being away for a while will make sure to make a trip of it and do that whole transect from Copper Harbor to the Mining Museum in Nagani to Fayette in the Garden Peninsula. I think you will be blown away if you haven't visited those sites before. I really think you will love it or any, any one of the above if you can't make it to all in one trip. Um, so, and then I also wanted to put in a, a special little plug for any of you who happen to be alumni or other attendees in the area and you happen to have middle school or high school age children, there is a wonderful future historians program that takes place at the Iron Industry Museum. So sometimes people are even commuting all the way from Houghton and Hancock to this weekly uh, sorry, monthly program. And then you can prepare, the, the children can prepare to be costumed interpreters at the, the um, one of the forts, usually at Fort Wilkins, or sometimes there's maybe one event a year at Fayette. And just as a parent of two sons who participated in that program for several years, it's really a magical program. And it is just, it's really fun to get immersed in that history that you just learned about this evening. So what I'd like us to do is turn to some of the great questions that have come in through the Q&A. And we have about 10 more minutes, but I think we can get to um, probably all of the questions, or at least most of them. And I thought maybe we could do it either way, but I thought maybe because um, Troy is in front of the camera, but now I see Barry there. I was thinking maybe we could start with the questions that were more on the second half of the presentation and then we would go um, back to some of the information covered earlier. So um, one of these, um, let's see, there's, there's a bunch that are related to the Fayette presentation. So let's start with this. Why is it called a blast furnace? So I'll have Troy answer that one. Yeah, uh, blast. They're called blast furnaces because they're they're when they're in blast, they're fired. Um, so that you would put um, the ingredients into the top of the furnace, and there would actually be a hot air blast uh, from a blowing engine. So it'd be blasting hot air into the heart, and it would actually get hot enough to melt the iron ore. So it's called a blast furnace, and, and not just fats, but any blast furnace. They're still called blast furnaces today. Actually, uh, the process is very similar. Uh, but any any blast furnace, and there were some 30 of them across the, the Upper Peninsula in the late 1800s, but that's why. Okay, and then the next one was um, from a different person, but it is related. So I'm going to ask this one, and, and I'm not a historian, I'm a geographer. So to me, the answer to this question is all about geography, but it's a great question. And um, this person had asked or had first commented that she didn't realize that the UP also has limestone. Why didn't the UP become a steel refining center with all the materials already located there? Well, that's a pretty good question. <laughs> I get that a lot. And uh, uh, in part, um, you know, I, I, I think there might have been potential for it at one point, uh, but the steel industries or the steel plants in the lower Great Lakes had already been established. And, you know, for a time, it looked like um, the Upper Peninsula had everything it needed with the charcoal. Uh, to make pig iron, which was eventually converted into, um, you know, Bessemer steel. 
Uh, but when the market really started to fade, it really faded um, in the 1880s for uh, because of coal, the improvements with the coal, using coal in blast furnaces um, really supplanted the charcoal iron. And um, so it's, it seems pretty natural that they would bulk ship the ore down to the lower Great Lakes, especially with the uh, improved shipping in the Sault Ste. Marie Canal. It was fairly you could fairly cheaply ship the ore. Okay, great. And then another question came up while you were presenting, Troy, and that was, um, it probably relates as well to the Fort Wilkins portion, but um, a good one. Where did they get all the feed for the animals that they were raising to eat? Most of all, you know, that was mostly what was referred to. The UP isn't exactly a breadbasket, said the, the attendee. Right. You want to go for sure. <clears throat> um, the, the United States Army contracted with a firm out of Detroit to ship straw and, and feed up to Sault Ste. Marie, and it would sit there until the next vessel was ready to bring it. And they had a lot of problems with spoilage. They did not have any um, pasture land near Fort Wilkins, you know, a lot of pine trees, and, and it was very difficult. So everything had to be shipped north, and I, I don't have that list in front of me, but when I was talking about the number of doors and the number, they also listed the amount of pounds of feed that they had to send north for animals. So it was an issue. Um, and, you know, when you're that far away from your supply, and it takes that long to get things, and often things would sit and rot, uh, it was a big challenge um, for, for, uh, to feed uh, animals, at least up at Copper Harbor when the fort was occupied. And for Fayette, it was similar. I mean, import, they had a, a small grain elevator at Fayette where they could store grain. But uh, the UP is not a breadbasket, that's for sure. But actually, the Garden Peninsula actually is pretty productive in terms of agriculture, especially when the trees were cleared uh, for alpha charcoal production. So there, was agri there were people in, in surrounding Fayette in agriculture as well. Um, and at Fort Wilkins, they actually had to um, because they did not have enough feed, the commanding officer ordered that the majority of the beef cattle be slaughtered uh, at the onset of winter so they could freeze it over winter and, and uh, have it available for later on because it was said that they were losing flesh uh, because they were starting to get a little thin because they didn't have enough food. So. Okay, we have one last question about the iron ore and then I'm, I'm gonna to switch to some questions more about Fort Wilkins. And that is where does most iron ore come from today? Worldwide or the, the United okay. States? China and Brazil are, yeah. are large producer, larger producers of, uh, of iron ore than, than um, the United States, but within the United States, um, Minnesota and Michigan, Canada also produces. Okay, great. Let's um, take some questions for Fort Wilkins. And this, there's a couple that are also kind of about the, the logistics there. Um, the first one that came in was, if they ship the Fort Wilkins materials from Detroit, how did they get through what is now the Sioux? Presumably referring to the Sioux locks. Sure. Um, during the first occupation, obviously there, it was a rapid. So what they would do is, at that time there was only two supply vessels on Lake Superior. The um, uh, John Jacob Astor and the other one escapes me right now, but they would portage it. So they would offload all the supplies and everything and move it and then reload it on the vessel on Lake Superior. And they, they had a tram that they had, it was sort of a rail system to move goods from Lake Huron up to Lake Superior. And it took time, uh, obviously. And uh, going back along with the animals, when the animals were shipped on it, you know, the Astor was only 78 foot long. And if, if you, it was chock full of supplies and, and everything that came with it. But imagine those 14 head of beef cattle on the, out on the deck. How do you get them off of the boat to get to Fort Wilkins? Well, they would just push them off right into the water and have them swim. So it was an easy way to do it. Um, during the second occupation, the Sulak was open. So um, it, it was, uh, it took, well, it took 18 days for them to get up there with all their supplies to build the place. Um, in 1870, you could get from Detroit to Copper Harbor in three days uh, because of the lock. So, and that also opened up 
um, the industry for, for mining because now it was easier to get goods and the raw materials down to the uh, processing and to get people and supplies to come back up. So after 1855, it really opened up the region um, for mining and, and settlement and, and uh, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, one other question, that, another question that came up was, is there any documentation about the women present at Fort Wilkins? That is, did they come up to, for, up to the fort with their husbands, for instance? Yes, um, there's, uh, there's documentation through the, uh, the Army records at the National Archives, as well as um, census records and correspondence that we've, we've found um, through uh, research and that sort of thing. So um, yes, there, there were women, uh, each um, married enlisted men would have their wives were typically laundresses so there would be four women to each 100 men to wash laundry for the troops um, they were paid a dollar per man per month and um, but they had oftentimes a difficult difficult time getting paid at the fort because the paymaster couldn't get up there um, and and the laundresses were supposed to get paid right after the post sutler which was a storekeeper within the fort property um, we had documentation about that um, we also had documentation, you know, I mentioned Fanny Ho and her sister, Richard Edda. Um, she was the wife of Daniel Ruggles, who was a, a lieutenant at the post, and who actually went on to become a general for the South during the Civil War. Um, he was an interesting guy. So, yeah, we do have uh, information on women at the fort and uh, for long-term planning. There will be another exhibit specifically towards uh, that that gender and that venue because it, it's a good story that needs to be told because they were an important part of the army up there and uh, not only doing laundry but taking care of families and, and uh, being part of everything. Okay, that's something to look forward to then. Okay, we'll probably take about two more questions here. I know we're a little bit beyond eight but the, the questions are so good and the audience is so attentive. So. Um, this one is a, also a good one. It seems like a costly miscalculation for the U.S. government to build a fort and then abandon it after just a few years. What would you say were the key influencers of the decision process to establish the fort? Uh, in theory, uh, Fort Wilkins was the northernmost of a chain of western posts that formed a national line of defense. Um, so that was a part of it, but um, Native American or Indian removal was also a part of it. And that was during the time when uh, they were pushing natives out of their homelands through treaties or other means to open up the West for settlement. Um, and repeat again and again, um, the question, Susie. Oh, just the key influencers in the decision process to establish the fort, if okay. in the end it wasn't really needed. Yeah, um, that came that came directly from the top. Um, the Secretary of War, so I mentioned Porter's Island, that was named after Secretary of War Porter, and Fort Wilkins was actually named after the Secretary of War, William Wilkins. And they got their marching orders that, uh, yes, we need to have a military presence on the frontier, just in case something bad would happen between the natives and the miners, but it never really happened. And obviously they realized it right away when they took half of the strength of the troops and moved them to the Mexican War, and then a year later closed the post down. Okay, um, this is a question that is specifically for Barry. Do you envision both lighthouses in Copper Harbor will be open and the museums, I assume that means this summer, and could you explain why Copper Harbor had two lighthouses? Okay, um, the, the lighthouse on the point, um, the Copper Harbor Lighthouse, basically marks Copper Harbor as a place of refuge. And its light denotes, if, um, each light the house has a characteristic. And the one at Copper Harbor is flashing, it's, it's flashing greens in six seconds, it flashes. And um, there's a book called The Light List and that'll tell you where you're located based on the characteristic of the light, as well as what the lighthouse looks like. And it also serves as a day mark. So it basically the Copper Harbor lighthouse, is mar lighthouse marks Copper Harbor. 
the range lights are lead lights. So what the, the lights, uh, the, the range lights do is you can line up the lights one behind the other and a mariner will head straight for those and it will guide a vessel safely through the deepest and safest part of a channel entrance. So one sort of guides ships in, the other marks um, where they can seek refuge. And the lighthouse opening, it has been closed for the last several years because we have not had a boat concessioner by contract. Uh, the contract is administered through the Parks and Recreation Division. Uh, they are looking hard at finding a concession. They have someone that they think is interested, so we're waiting to hear about that. Um, but we're also waiting to hear about social distancing rules because this vessel's not very large. So um, we'll have to wait and see. Now the range lights um, are across from Fort Wilkins. They are available for people to walk the grounds, but you can't go inside. We've done a lot of restoration work on that structure. And um, we're still trying to determine exactly what we're going to do with that building, but it has been restored extensively the last several years. We've done archeological investigations on that site as well. Okay, the great thing is the questions keep coming in. And so I think maybe we'll take a couple more, but I think a lot of the answers I would say can be um, answered just by going and visiting the fort. I mean, there's some really great ones like, is the John Jacob Astor named after the fellow on the Titanic or in the movie, he was on the Titanic. Um, was there a doctor at the fort? If not, how was medical care provided? And I know some of these are things that you could learn at the fort. So I don't know if you wanna answer anything more related to that or, or just encourage people to head up there this yeah, summer? Yeah, I think uh, Astor, I think that was his son that was on the Titanic. I'm not 100% on that, but it is named after uh, Astor and he was the head of the American Fur Company. So, um, and the vessel's um, anchor is part of a dive trail within Copper Harbor. So, um, when it broke free and this and it sank, it was it was Lake Superior's first shipwreck in September 1844. Uh, it broke its anchor and ran up on the rocks. It's actually called Astor Point out in front of the range lights, and uh, we've got some displays up there that talk about it. And I forgot the other one, Susie. I'm sorry. Oh, um, doctors. Yeah, the doctor at the fort. Yep. Um, there was two during the first occupation and uh, there was actually a uh, epidemic that hit the fort over Christmas of 1844 and Charles Isaacs was the uh, doctor at the post of, at that time. Uh, the epidemic struck the garrison hard, uh, ended up taking the life of one man and there was at least 13 cases, possibly more, and he ended up writing an article about the epidemic at the fort for the New York Journal of Medicine. And you can find that online. It's pretty interesting. He also gives a great description of the surrounding landscape and the climate and other things up there. Um, during the second occupation, and one of the few people to serve three years at Fort Wilkins um, was Dr. Robert Odell. He was a graduate from uh, the University of Michigan in 1866 and served at Fort Wilkins during the second occupation from 1867 to 1870. Okay, and I think we really have time. We'll take one more question. I think this is a good one to end on. Um, for the person who's wondering about how many, with immigrants from so many countries, how were language barriers overcome? I think part of that may be answered by visiting the mining museum, although I think part of the answer is the immigrant groups tended to kind of stick in their little clusters too sometimes, so. Um, they did, there was, there was over 40 different nationalities that settled and worked on Michigan's iron ranges. Uh, the mining companies often would print um, rules and regulations in native languages to help break that barrier. Um, and you're right, Susie, you know, Germans would congregate with Germans and, and Irish with Irish. And uh, they had some conflicts, Italians with Italians, Finns with Finns. And, um, but they would try to publish uh, books, but eventually, and there was a sign above one mine that read, um, if you can't, speak English move or something like that. So they were eventually telling them that you better learn language because we want you speaking English at the mines instead of your native language, so.
Okay, and then the last one for both of you, maybe you could each throw out one or two ideas. Um, the question was, are there any good books written about the UP that you would recommend? And I, in the chat, I put in Alan Kosky's new book about the Empire Mine, um, because the question had come in when that was, yeah. So any, any suggestions you have would be welcome. Um, Terry Reynolds wrote a, a corporate history called Iron Will of the Cleveland Cliffs Iron Company. Um, and Bob Archibald um, put together a, a, a group of articles or essays in honor of Dr. Russ Minyagi at Northern called Northern Borders. Northern Borders. And that includes, um, Troy wrote a piece on lumbering. There's a piece on Fort Wilkins in there among other Upper Peninsula related uh, history topics. And I would recommend for the Keweenaw Peninsula, uh, Larry Langton's book, Beyond the Boundaries. Um, it's more of a um, mid 1800s to late 1800s book, but it really covers the social history of that region. And it's not so much about um, mining, it's about the people, occupation, foodways, uh, free time, pastimes, that sort of thing. And I'll put in a plug for the really incredible gift shop at the Michigan Iron Industry Museum. A lot of these books are available there, or you can just browse in the bookstore and ask questions there. So that would be another place to just check it out and yep. get some good ideas. We, and we are stocked and ready. Good. And um, for those that like to do research and are interested too, our library has um, several books about mining in the region and, and immigration and that sort of thing that are available for research um, by appointment. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank Barry and Troy very much for this enlightening presentation and just say thank you to all the alumni and friends who are out there. It was really fun to watch in the chat all of your excitement sharing your experiences at Northern and who your favorite history professor was and so on. So that was really neat to see that engagement, you know, during during the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Kylie now. I know we're a little past our time, but this is something that we could talk forever about. So thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. Thanks to Susie, Troy, and Barry. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. And uh, thank you to everybody for joining us. Just a couple notes to wrap us up. Um, don't forget to sign up for our last Northern Now of the semester on June 9th with Chef Alden Griffiths. Uh, that's, you can find information on our website. I'll also be sending an email tomorrow that will have the sign up for that, as well as the link to this recording in case you've missed any of the presentation or um, if you would like to share with any fellow alumni or friends who might be interested. Um, keep in touch with us on social media. My email tomorrow will also have a short survey where you can share with us some of these ideas. I know a few came in in the chat um, that I definitely have written down, but any ideas for future presentations or, or topics that you'd like to hear about, please be sure you share with us. Um, I also will be choosing a winner uh, from tonight's attendees. Um, to receive uh, an alumni t-shirt. So make sure you keep an eye on your email. I'll choose that tomorrow and send you a quick email if you're the one who won. And uh, again, if any other questions pop into your mind or we didn't get to questions that you would like answered, feel free to email us at alumni at nmu.edu and we can um, get those to Troy and Barry and get you the answers. Or please go visit any of these, uh, any of these locations and you can get a lot of your questions answered as well. So thank you so much. I appreciate you all coming and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.